Amen. What a thrill it is to see you here today in the house of God. To see and hear fellowship in the body of Christ talking and interacting and fellowshipping. That is a blessing to a pastor. But more than that, God smiles when he sees his people getting together. Thank you again for being here today. One of the greatest gifts that you can give a pastor is not a dollar in his pocket, uh, but it's attending the house of God. So thank you for being here today. I won't keep you long. I know the weeks have been busy. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for springtime. I'll even take the allergies and the pollen, but I'm ready for some nice weather. Thank you for being here today. I hope that you've had a good week. Uh, I, I, I hope that you've walked in victory this past week. My prayer is that in your daily time with God, where you read and pray and seek the face of the Lord, I hope that in your daily time with God, that that time is blossoming and that your roots are growing deep in the Word and that you are becoming a people of passionate prayer. I hope that if you're not Spirit-filled, that you're seeking the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are a Pentecostal church and we believe in the unction and the function of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you ever have a question about what we believe, let's sit down and talk. I don't know it all, but I know somebody that has it all. And so I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're growing in the Lord. And if you was to have fallen this week, I'm glad you got back up. He is a God that forgives. And so thank you for being here today. If you'll turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, a few verses here, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, be on the screen, beginning in verse 19. If you'd like to be baptized, we're going to have two baptismal services. Got a wedding this Saturday, you don't want to miss that one either. Wednesday night fellowship, meal, small groups. Check the bulletin for all the activities we have. Men's fellowship, breakfast coming up, and other events. Please be a part. I hear people say, we need to fellowship, show up for fellowship, and I think it will satisfy that quench. Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Korathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Did you see that? So they rose early in the morning, this is the next day, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekiah, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army, and they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the honor and privilege it is to stand before you and this great people today. Lord, nowhere else I'd rather be than right here. And so, Lord, today I anoint my lips to preach like a man from another world so that we can leave this place in victory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. Just for the next few moments this morning, I want to preach to you something that jumped off the page this week as my wife and I were reading the Bible. We strive to read the Bible together. We're making our journey through the Old Testament. We're halfway through, and it's been just such a privilege to have a spouse to, to read with, to pray with, and if you don't do that, I challenge you, start today. Today's a new day. It's a fresh day. Today is the day to begin. But I want to preach something today that is near and dear to the heart of God. You know, sometimes in life, we allow things to be stolen. We live in a time where crime is high. And if things aren't chained down and locked down, things get stolen. I mean, people will bash out car windows to take a purse or a phone, a tablet. Uh, they'll, they'll even steal your pets. Hello? We live in a day and age where 
mobs of teenagers flock in the stores and there's 15 or 20 at a time and they steal all they can and run out and there's only one or two security guards and there's nothing they can do. And sometimes in life, we allow things to be stolen from us. Other times, we simply lose stuff. Have you ever lost anything? Maybe we decided to trade what we had away. We had something and we seen something that we wanted more and so we swapped. Sometimes we just give stuff up or throw it in the trash or sell it on marketplace or yard sale. And then there's times that we simply let the newness wear off and we neglect it. We reject it. And the Bible warns us that we even have an enemy of our soul who is, can I tell you the devil's always on the job? He never takes a break. He never misses a day at work. He arises early. He stays up late. He's always on the job. And the Bible warns us that one of the things that the enemy of our soul does is he's looking to steal something from you. We read in Scripture about the subject today where many have laid it down, traded, gave up, neglected it, and then they lived a life in defeat. What are we talking about today? Today I want to preach what is near and dear to the heart of God, and that is praise. Have we lost our praise? Has life and life circumstances and politics and the economy and the family, have they stolen our praise? I'll wait for a minute. Have we lost our praise? With the weightiness of life and the burdens and the cares and the concerns and the fears, have, have we lost our praise? Have, have we allowed our praise to be ripped from our hand? Have we traded our praise for what others think of us? Have we gave our praise away? Have we neglected or rejected to even give praise? I want to tell you today that praise changes things. So if you struggle with any of these like I do, you're in the right place. You're watching online today, you're in the right place. Maybe praise has escaped your lips. Let's talk about praise this morning for a moment. Can I tell you that a marriage that's filled with praise will prosper? But if a marriage is filled with criticism and complaints, it will fail. Oh, better not look at anybody dead on. I'll just look at me. My wife is a praiser. She praises me. Now, of course, we have those meetings where we sit down and we talk and say, I don't really understand why you did what you did. I'm not here to be your daddy or be your boss. I'm just here to let's work this out. But I found out that when you offer praises to people, it, it kind of propels them and it kind of pushes them to do more. Husbands, I can only speak to you today because I'm a husband. Husbands, can I have your attention? Every husband, husband to be, start praising your wife, even if it alarms them. See, praise changes things. There's four elements to praise. Four elements to praise. First one is purpose. What in the world is the purpose for praise, preacher? Why do I need to praise my wife and my kids? Why do I need to praise God? What is the purpose or the function of praise? David tells us that you and I were created to praise the Lord. If you're here today and you're alive, then you're alive today because God created you in His image to praise Him. Isaiah, the great 
prophet in the Old Testament who saw things nobody else ever saw. In fact, in the year Uzziah died, Isaiah saw into the very throne room of God and he writes a description unlike any other body, anybody else in the Bible. And Isaiah tells us that for the glory of God, we were created and to praise his name. When we praise God, we are fulfilling the reason he created us. To the praise of his glory. That's why David writes in Psalm 150, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. He doesn't write if you want to, or if you just, that's your personality, or if that's the way you're made up. He doesn't qualify it except to say, if you've got breath, praise the Lord. We are told in Psalm 100 that we ought to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks and bless his holy name. We are created to praise. That's why God gave us a mouth and a tongue and lungs and hands and feet, fingers and toes so we could express with emotions praises unto God. And because we were created to praise, we have a praise in us. There is the call in Scripture and the command to praise. And we know that God lives among the praises of his people. I have found that because my wife gives me praise, I want to be close to her all the time. There's not a moment that I think, well, I need a break. Now, if my marriage was full of criticism, I wouldn't want to be around. If I worked a job where people constantly criticized, I wouldn't want to be here. I wouldn't want to live in a community or a neighborhood where everybody's constantly criticized. We even praise the little doggy. I think that's why he sticks around. Praise. I want to tell you today because we were created to praise, then you have a praise in you. And when you praise God, he says, I'll come and live. I will inhabit. I will dwell in the place of praise. See, when we praise God, it brings his presence near. Psalms 22, 3. The Bible says, but you are holy, Lord, and you are enthroned or you inhabit. You live in the praises of Israel. What's the purpose of praise? Praise keeps our focus on God. Lately, we've been focused on the government, elections, what stunts going to be pulled, what pandemic's going to show up, how many mail-in ballots are going to be found. Who's really going to get elected? We're worried about the economy, the bank, the paycheck, the inflation, eclipses, earthquakes. We're worried about all these things and since we were created to praise, the purpose of praise is that when we begin to praise, we look at what we're praising and if you praise God, you're looking at Him and your focus comes off the world. See, complaining always leads to compromise. But praise leads to the provision and the protection of God. We ought to praise God because He is great and greatly to be praised. Praise puts the focus on the object or the person that we're praising. Did you know praise keeps us humble? Praise makes the enemy flee. Praise brings a, reflect, a refreshing. So that is the purpose of praise. Then the second element. There is a place. Of praise. Now we know we're supposed to praise in here. David writes, praise him in the sanctuary. 
It should be easy in this house, outside, away from, separated, sanctified from the world. It ought to be easy for us to gather in this house and lift our hands and lift our voice and lift the shaft. This is a place of praise. In fact, there should never be a moment in this place that there isn't a praise being raised. Regardless of how we feel, how the week went, what someone said to us, what was done to us, This is a place of praise. Where else then, preacher, should we praise the Lord? Well, when I read about Job, he found him in, himself in a place of despair. He had lost everything. He had lost all his possessions, all his wealth. He had lost buildings. He had lost flock. He had lost cattle. He had lost income. Had that not been enough, he had lost his children and their spouses and their children. And Job found himself sitting in ashes of ruin. He was in a place of despair. But at that place of despair, the Bible says Job offered up praises to God. We should give God praise even in the worst of times. We find David being pursued by Saul, living on the run as an outcast. Even after victory against the giant and delivering Israel from the Philistines, he finds himself being chased by a jealous king, and he had all his wives and possessions and valuables, 400 men of valor, all their stuff had been kidnapped, and David has found himself in a cave all alone. His men turned against him, but what does he do in this place of darkness? The Bible says that David lifted up a praise. When we are alone in despair, we should still praise the Lord. Paul and Silas, you should know the story in the book of Acts, in the midnight hour, in the darkest moment of their life, they had been beaten, arrested, chained to a wall. They were in great pain and agony. Death was awaiting the future. Did not look good. They could have easily complained about everything that was wrong, but at midnight, Paul and Silas said, we're probably probably going to die in the morning. We don't have much to look forward to here, but at midnight, the Bible says, they sang praises unto God. In fact, when King David came down to his deathbed, he's getting ready to die. It's recorded in the book of Chronicles. David's last words to all those that would ever read in the history of the pages of the Bible, his last words were, you need to praise God in the morning. You need to praise God in the evening regardless of the night you've had no matter where you are no matter the place you at David said God deserves all the praise there is never a place that you and I should not praise the Lord from home to work from work to home from school to the marketplace from the darkest hour to the brightest day we ought to offer up praises to God so we have the purpose of praise we have the place of praise. Then there is the position of praise. Or you could say posture. Praise, I found out, is a sacrifice. Sacrifice means something had to die. It might be pride. It might be what others think about you. You might have to sacrifice your feelings, your emotions, your personality, your makeup, your DNA. Because I want to tell you the posture and position matters. Consider this example. When a young man meets a woman that he wants to impress, he stands straight up. He makes himself bigger than he really actually is. He puts his shoulder back and he sucks his gut in. Can I get a witness in the house? He dresses nice. Did you feel that? I felt it. He cleans up. He didn't want to go on a date stinking and dirty. And when he's talking to the girl he wants to impress, he looks her in the eye. Makes eye contact. When he wants to propose a good man, I get down on one knee. His posture matters. And when a good man messes up, he gets down on both knees. Says, baby, I blew it. I messed up. 
Posture matters. Now we can talk tough, but if someone pulls a gun on you, you're probably going to raise your hands and surrender. That innocent child, their posture matters. And so the little child, even before sentences can be completely formed, when they want you to hold them, they go. Posture, position matters. At sporting events, when your team scores, I've seen people jump in the air, pump their fists, scream and holler as loudly as they can. And when the, when the ref makes a bad call, you throw your hands up in frustration, you boo vigorously, and then you try to out-coach the coach. Family night, does anybody have them? Family night can bring about different postures and positions. Just tell the three-year-old no, and you'll see it. See that one that has a competitive spirit when they start losing, you'll see postures and positions. Maybe a fishing or golfing or camping or cookout or just a family gathering, any event from driving down the highway to meeting somebody new after eating a great meal, we're always showing forth posture and position. And praise has a posture and a position. Here's what I've learned. Your heart is caught up in the experience of the moment, which causes your body to respond outwardly. For the note takers, I want to say that again. Your heart, when it gets caught up in an experience of the moment, you have nerves and muscles and electrodes in your body that cycle through your brain and then back to the reaction. So when you and I get caught up in a moment of an experience, it causes our body to respond outwardly. You ever ate something good and you went, ah. You ever seen something you liked and your face lit up? You ever smashed your thumb? What's on the inside comes out. There's postures and positions to praise. Paul writes to Timothy, and here's what he says. Paul's writing to Pastor Timothy, and he says, I desire that men would raise their hands everywhere. That men would raise holy hands unto God. That men would lift up a praise with their hands unto God. I want to tell you, Paul wasn't a sissy man. See, our outward posture expresses an inward reality. The Bible shows us many different postures and positions of praise. From praising God with instruments to our own ten string instruments to give God applause, feet to stand, from a mouth and lungs to sing and magnify, from shouts of praise to bowing down. When we give thanks and testify, sometimes the Bible even uses the word loud. There's no such thing as a silent, still praise. That's why David writes Psalms 150. When one never praises, it's simply a problem on the inside. You see, when a posture or position of praise is never seen, it's the absence of an inward relationship with God. The absence of outward expression is simply saying, I'm dead on the inside. Four times in Scripture, we read this plea. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Praise always has a position, and a posture. Praise has a purpose. And praise always has a place. The fourth and last element to praise is that there is power. I said there is power in praise. When we praise the Lord, 
When we understand our purpose that we were created for, and we understand there's never a place not to praise, and we begin to understand the position and posture of praise, then we will experience the power of praise. When we praise the Lord's strength is renewed. Our spirits are lifted. Praise breaks off chains and opens doors. Praise invites God onto the stage of our life into every situation. Praise will make walls fall flat and it will make enemies flee. Praise changes the temperature and atmosphere of our lives spirit. So we have the purpose of praise, the place of praise, the position of praise, and the power of praise. Now to our text. In our text, in 2 Chronicles, Jehoshaphat is king of Judah. And here we find the Ammonites, the Moabites, and Mount Seir, three different groups of people, Three enemies have joined together and they have said, we are coming to kill you, Jehoshaphat. We're coming to prove that your God is not real and then we're going to take all your people slaves and we're going to wipe Judah off the map. That's pretty big talk. Three different enemies coming together as one to defeat Jehoshaphat and all of Judea. Here's the facts. Judea is severely outnumbered. Judea had less weapons, less chariots, less spears. And it looked like defeat was imminent. Jehoshaphat gets this news. And so he stands in the assembly of the people just like I'm standing before you today in the assembly of the Connection Point Church of God. And Jehoshaphat prays and calls out to God. And then the prophet tells him to go down and go out against them tomorrow. But before the battle, before the fight, before any sign of victory, before an arrow is shot and a bow is launched, before a, 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 a camel is lit, before a horse is lighted before a chariot is filled, the people said, we're going to praise God. We may lose. It doesn't look good. The news is bad. We may die tomorrow. We may be removed from our land. Our king may get killed. But we're going to stand in the assembly of the people today before God, and we're going to lift up a praise. And so there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we read that the whole assembly, men, women, boys and girls, young and old, married and single we we read that they begin to lift up a praise unto God they begin to shout they begin to magnify they begin to exalt and the Bible said they did it loudly it wasn't just a short little quite feeble praise no here were valiant men of war and instead of that moment picking up weapons and war of words, they lifted up a praise. The priest, did you know the priest were strong men in Israel? If you study the history, they wasn't weak, timid men. No, they had bulging biceps and they were big. Well, how do you know, preacher? Because they were the ones that would grab the ox and sacrifice it and then throw that ox on the altar. And they did it day after day after day. So you had men of war lifting a praise. You had the priest lifting a praise. You had the children lifting a praise. You had the women lifting a praise. The young and the old, everybody was praising God, and they were doing it with all that they had. Imagine the noise. I would imagine that place was shaken. What's happened to our praise? See, everyone here in 2 Chronicles was involved. They understood the purpose of praise. They made the place they were at a place of praise. And then they assumed the posture and position of praise. And suddenly, we need a suddenly moment. And suddenly they began to experience the power of praise because the praise brought the presence of God. Suddenly encouragement came. 
Hope began to stir. Strength was found. Things began to change so much that the next morning, before they went to battle, they said, we got to do that again. Yesterday's gone. It's a brand new day. Yesterday is forgotten and today is a new day. Did you know they assembled again with all the strength they had and there they were again. The men of valor, the priests, the women, the children, the young and the old. They didn't say we could live off what we did yesterday. They said no, today's a brand new day. Today is the day of war. Today we're going to fight battle. Today Today we're going to face the enemy. But before we face the enemy, we're going to stand and lift up a praise unto Almighty God. We understood that He created us to praise Him. And we're going to make this a place of praise. We're going to assume the posture of praise. Do you know what happened on that next morning? Power came to those men. Strength came to those warriors. And because they praised, they never had to lift a weapon. They never had to draw a spear. Hallelujah. The Bible says that because they praised, that God Himself set up ambushes and took care of the enemy. I wonder today, has anybody had any enemies come against you? The enemies turned on each other. They killed each other. But when Judah praised God, even before the battle, victory came. This praise brought and ushered in the presence of God. It brought the power of God. And that praise confused the enemies. Not only did victory come, but if you read the entirety of the chapter, blessings begin to flow. Provision they had all the source and resource that they needed. And it all began because a people understood their purpose, place, position, and power of praise. What's happened to our praise? It's from this great account that we find powerful scriptures like this. Do not be afraid nor dismayed for the battle is not yours, it is God's. From this text, we get great scriptures like this. We don't know what we're going to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. We get another great text from this Second Chronicles chapter 20 where we read, stand still and see the salvation of God. I want to tell you that we must become a people of praise. We must understand that we were created to pray. Sin may have disformed you, but God can transform you. You may have come from a meek, timid family. You may not have it in your DNA or makeup, but when you get a hold of God and God gets a hold of you, He said, behold, I make all things new. The old has passed away way and the new has come when we understand that when I God created us. He said, I'm creating you to be a praiser. I'm creating you to be a magnifier. I'm creating you to be a glorifier. And then when we understand there's not a place that we can't praise, and when we assume the posture and position of praise, then God will show up in power and in might, and He will fight the battle for you. Hallelujah. Now we're called to praise each other. We are. See, praise affects everything. Men, have you already forgotten the challenge? Praise your spouse, even if it alarms you. Absolutely, you ought to correct your children. Sometimes I want to do it. Don't clap. You shouldn't clap because then when I do it, I go to jail. I came up different. It didn't hurt me one bit. But on that note, you ought to praise your children. Hey, you did good. Well, I can't believe you got C. Why didn't you give me an H? Hey, man, that's great. You got a C. That's good. You didn't fail. Hallelujah, let's go get an ice cream cone. And we got, why are you eating an ice cream cone? Hey, son, that's so good. I, I, th I, think, I think probably, you, you probably just do a little bit better. 
Because I, I know that, that there's good in you. There's greatness in you. And that praise will promote them and propel them to say, you know what, I think I can get a B. And if they can get a B, they might be able to get an A. Praise. We ought to praise others. I praise you for being here today. I do. Thank you. I praise my wife. I tell her how. I can't tell you everything I tell her. I, Josh, I about just let it roll off my tongue. But some things are meant, you know what I'm saying. I tell my wife every day, I said, baby, you are so beautiful. And I make praise. Can I give you an ungodly example? I'm a football fan. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. I'll help you get to school and, and you, you can do all the stuff. And in about five years, you can be a preacher. And you can pastor a church and then you can use your own example. I like the Steelers. And if my math is right, look into the history. In my lifetime, there have been 70 times at Three Rivers and Heinz Field, now AccuSure Stadium, 70 times since, since I've been alive, that they was going into the fourth quarter at home and they were behind. And they got this ritual that in the fourth quarter, if they're behind, they play this song. I think it's Renegade. And for about three minutes, that stadium goes wild. And they begin to praise. And they begin to exalt that team down on the field. I've been there. I've been there when we were down 17 points in the fourth quarter. And they play that song and praises begin to lift up out of that stadium. And it falls down. And you can start to feel a shift. And suddenly those players that are tired find some energy. And suddenly somebody makes a play because fans believe in them. And 70 times they came from behind in the fourth quarter to win the game. Now that's an ungodly example of praise. How much more when we praise the God of heaven who has all power and authority, who loves you and cares about you, He longs for you, He wants to be with you, He wants to help you, He wants to push you. And How much greater can God who has all power and authority when His people say, I'm going to lift up a praise unto heaven and then God will come to the rescue and come to the scene. I got to close. But praise affects you and I. Praise will affect the situation. Praise will affect the devil. Praise will affect the outcome. But just as praise affects in a good way, the lack of praise affects everything in a bad. When there's no praise, it invites the devil to come and sit with you. When there's no praise, it allows discouragement and depression and defeat to settle down into your heart. Lack of praise blocks the blessings of God. And it causes the darkness of the enemy to spread. That's why the enemy doesn't want you to praise. It's why he tells you that's not who you are. That's out of your character. Somebody will laugh at you. Somebody will make fun of you. Don't praise because the devil knows the moment you begin to praise that it will affect everything, that it will affect the situation and the outcome of the situation. It will affect you in a good way. Hebrews 13 tells us that we ought to continue Offer up the sacrifice of praise. Peter tells us to proclaim the praises of the one who has called you out of darkness. Isaiah says, I will praise your name. I will exalt you. Isaiah goes on to go into great detail and he says, hell can't praise you. 
The grave can't praise you. So yet while I live, I will lift up a praise unto you. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his eyes toward heaven and said, I'm going to praise you, and then made a degree that all would praise him. Oh, I like this verse. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Would you stand to your feet all over this place? I don't know what you've gone through lately. I don't know the battle that you've been fighting. I don't know the defeat that maybe you've suffered. But I know this. If we'll stand in the assembly and we'll pray and call out to God and then let God do His work. And it's our job. Our purpose was to praise Him. I, 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 this is the place of praise. And we got to assume the posture or position of praise. And when we do, praise will bring the presence and the power of God. I wonder if anybody right now has a praise in you. I wonder if anybody right now has a praise in you. Has God been good to anybody? Has God saved anybody? Has God healed anybody? Has God kept you from your own mess? Then we ought to lift up a shout. We ought to lift up a praise. We ought to assume the posture and the position of praise. I want to tell you, a praise will change everything. Turn it up, brother. Can we just take a few minutes today and praise God? Come on. We're family. We're family. Lord, I don't really care what it is.